Welcome to the Rebel Entrepreneur Podcast. Today's episode is about presenting, storytelling, and communicating, which is one of those interesting things that you either love or hate, like Marmite. Now, the American audience might not know what Marmite is, but you either love it or hate it. Something you put on your toast. It's not nice. I hate it. Presenting seems to have the same thing. Some people have learned to fall in love with it and others utterly hate it to the extent it's the last thing they could ever want to do. And that's what this episode is about. So joining me tonight, I'm very lucky to have Nate. Nate is here with me. And Nate, you messaged me and said, I want to learn about presentation skills where do i go mm-hmm. and i thought well maybe i could help tell us tell us more about why we're here what the story is yeah um so uh, just a little history just uh i work uh in a, a great ministry here uh in the states uh called uversion and um in the last year i've risen in um, um what the level of presentation that I need to give to leaders, uh, various organizations, um, leaders inside of our organization. And I've recognized that it's a skill I haven't practiced or developed over the last uh, few years. And I've just noticed people that tend to be at that level um, really need a way to not just do the work, but present it and talk about it really well to represent uh, the things that they're responsible for in a great light. And so just know that I need improvement in that area if I want to continue to progress. And um, it's just a way to help tell a story and, 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 and generate um, energy and excitement around the things that um, I get to steward there. I love that. So where are we starting, Nate? Uh, are you at the end where you really don't like to present? Are you quite comfortable, but you want to improve your skills? Where are we starting? I would say that I'm comfortable and I'm awkward. So both those things are true. (laughs) So um, thankfully, um, I I believe the church I get to work at is called Life Church. They they have some of the best communicators out there. They have a lot of practice um, at the campuses, and I I know I can practice and hone my skills. And so I actually started um, my presentation, started learning how to present in front of people probably seven, eight years ago Um, in in two different ways. One, I was... um, uh, I used to have to do these huddles before um, I would send volunteers out to do their work for about an hour. And so I practiced my communication skills and we called it stage time. I would practice that in front of uh, some staff members and stuff that were excellent communicators. And so I, I really got a feel for presenting in front of people and focusing on no feel do and those types of things. And then also at the same time, I was volunteering um, at a local RIA group. Um, RIA is a real estate investment association. And um, as I progressed there, they really liked me to teach. Um, they called it getting your financial house in order. And so I would teach that. And so I would present in front of, you know, a group of 80, 90 people on any given month. Uh, we do these yearly events. And so I, I'm no stranger to presenting. Um, but those were like big events where I would, you know, either be like a three minute huddle or less huddle where I'd have to prep every week or it would be a you know, big thing I'd gear up for and prep and have a month or two to prep and practice and and do that. Now I find myself needing to present more often, um, uh, you know, a few times a week, even a few times a month. And it could, it could any, it could be anywhere from 15 minutes to 30 minutes to three minute huddle. And so, um, figuring out how to, you know, when I have a lot of prep and I practice, I feel like I'm good. And I'll probably still need to spend time there, but just figuring out how to make a rhythm of practice and communicating and getting better and stuff like that. Cool. Love it. Got it. Okay. So you're fairly comfortable, sometimes a bit awkward, and you've got to present. It sounds like you need like a little system to get to be able to present well quite quickly. So they tell you you're going to be presenting next week or you decide I'm going to present at the meeting and you need mm-hmm. to like write something, get it ready and be able to deliver it powerfully fairly quickly. Um, so I have a a little system that I use. Is it all right if we start there and then we can like explore with questions from there? That would be amazing. Yeah. I love it. So my little system is three questions I ask myself before I present. I think through the answers then I come up with what's my structure 
and we'll go into that afterwards. So like the first questions, I think you probably know them, but I think it's going to help everyone listening to this. Mm-hmm. The first is, who am I presenting to? Like, who's my audience? Who am I presenting to? Is it the senior leadership team? Is it my team? Is it like, who is it? Because the better you know who they are, the better you can think, how am I going to hit my target? How am I going to inspire them? So that's always my first question is, who is it? Who, who am I going to speak to? That's good. So I'm pretty practiced and comfortable with presenting to my team or um, um, people that I'm responsible for um, and, and, and clarity and direction and, and tasks. And I have systems and processes for that. The new muscle that I'm flexing is presenting to um, leaders, executive leaders, and um, peer leaders across, um, both for awareness of things where we're going in product, uh, for and in, in specifically for me, or um, how to collaborate together, or or things like that. But really, just like where are we going? Here's what we're doing. Here's the metrics we're trying to drive forward. Here's the the, the vision, the roadmap we're going forward, and trying to figure out a way to you know, create a process for that, articulate what I'm trying to communicate, uh, where there's a, um, clear, complete mutual understanding between, um, both parties, um, and hoping that the intent of what I'm trying to communicate across sticks, uh, doesn't just get hurt, but sticks. And so the, but the primary audience is like executive leaders and kind of, or, or, or a level below that is the primary audience that I, um, really the muscle that I'm, uh, having to flex a lot more. Perfect. So each time you go to do a presentation, the first question is who, because you would do it differently to a group of peers, Mm -hmm. peer leadership than you would to your team or to the other people. So the like very first question is always who. The -hmm. second question is what do they get out of listening to me? Like why would they listen to me? (laughs) What's the value for them? What are they getting out of it? And I think to give you one example I went to watch a series of presentations. You know, those nights where you get a bunch of speakers speaking Mm -hmm. and there was one lady there who it felt like she just told us what she did each day. And I must admit it was one of the most boring presentations I'd seen. And I was a bit confused going, why are you telling me this? And I went to her afterwards and said, you know, I, I would listen to your presentation. It was quite interesting what you did. Like, what was the meaning? What was the message? And she kind of looked a bit confused. What do you, what do you mean, Alan? What was the meaning? And I'm like, well, like, what were you trying to convey? And she said, well, I was asked to give a presentation about what I do for my day job. And that's what mm. she did. But there was no message. There was no meaning. There was no value. There was no, like, here's the piece. And sometimes we get caught up in this I have to tell people the roadmap. I have to tell people, I like, this is the, but we haven't thought why, like what's the value to that person. So that for me is the second question. Who am I presenting to and what's the value? What's the, what's in it for me? Yeah. So the, I have one meeting in mind in particular that maybe you could, as a specific that you could help me out with. So typically we do this monthly meeting, um, a little peek behind the curtain and it's, it's to, um, both my peer leadership group and the executives. And the goal of that meeting is to share specifically in the area that I help steward. Um, wh- how are we in, what are we, what are we working on? What did, oh, sorry. What did we do in the last quarter or month to impact um, the, we call them KPIs, but metrics that we're focused on the things that we said we were going to go do. How did they do? Did we deliver them on time? And then what are we planning to do in the next quarter or maybe sometimes the next year, uh, next half, next 18 months? That's the, um, that's the general um, vibe is kind of an information exchange of that. And then the goal of that is so that, one, we're all in alignment of kind of where we're going because each of us kind of speaks indirectly into us hitting some of our metrics together. Um, so, uh, so for example, marketing, you know, helps with driving reach and, and some engagement inside of our applications because they own some of the tools and messaging in there. Our content team does a great job. We have great partners that partner with us and provide content and plans and, um, and with all the goal of, 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 of um, you know, encouraging people to seek intimacy with God 
um, every day. So the, the, that's the presentation model. And then at the end, it's like questions specifics so that we all can kind of align together. And so all of us are presenting in that, but in my, you know, maybe it's sometimes it's between 15 to 30 minutes where I get to present and in about five to 10 minutes, 15 minutes of questions, depending on the topic. And so, um, it's usually done in a Google slide deck or sheets or something like that as a, as an exchange of information. And then I'm presenting on that and trying to, you know, either tell a story of where we're going or the metrics that we've done or the learnings that we've had. Um, yeah, that's this kind of the specifics. Cool. There. So that's the structure that you've got. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come on to a structure in a minute that I think will help. That's awesome. Um, this is kind of the questions that happen before you even get to the content. That's good. Before you even get to the content, like <clears throat> the question is why, why mm. am I doing this to these people? And I know what they told you. I know the purpose of the meeting. Yep. It's still, you, you said one bit in there right in the middle that for me is the big why, That's which good. is for your audience to come closer to God. That's, mm -hmm the big why and the whole yeah. why behind everything. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm thinking is, okay, I'm doing this to these peers. What's in it for them? Mm. They're on this mission. They're with yep. me. How am I helping them? How am I progressing the bigger mission? How am I helping the overall team? Like, no one, if this is, might sound bad and it's probably not true, but I find it gotcha. a useful frame for the world. Gotcha. No one cares what you're doing, Nate. In the nicest possible way, I don't care what you're doing. How does it That's affect good. me? Yep, uh, yep. And it's not always true because people are lovely, yes, but yes. it's a good way to have the frame of like, okay, like tell me how it impacts me, my team. How does it impact content? How does it impact marketing? How does For it sure. impact the overall me mission? That That is far more interesting than the details of like exactly what you did in the step-by-step -step process That's good. Uh, and it's going to get them more excited. Mm -hmm. And if you look at where people present, I always used to, uh, one of my biggest clients for many years was Microsoft. I got hired by Microsoft to teach them how to present and the teams I were helping with would send Microsoft engineers to communicate with chief technology officers, chief information officers of big companies. What level of detail do you think the engineers spoke at? Oh, yeah, they speak at a really highly detailed level normally when I talk to them. They're super smart, super yeah. smart, very yeah. clever, very detail focused. Mm -hmm. Which level of detail did the CTO or the CIO uh, care about? A uh, high level, especially when you're on a time limit. Yes, they, want to get, they just yep. give me the give me the like what's happened, why is it happened, how does this mm -hmm. affect me? A very high level, and my kind of part of what I did was help the engineers to chunk up to why. Mm -hmm. And the higher you go in any organization, the closer you get to the purest why. Like, mm. why are we actually doing it? And the longer, the more senior you are in an organization the more time you spend thinking about why and the less time you think about how. Mm, it's almost as if good. I'll set the why, <laughs> then yep. the people below me will like divvy up the why and work out what it is, and then they'll set the teams onto how to do it. Mm. And then the people at the bottom don't even think about why. It's just like, I've been asked to make this widget. <laughs> that's my role. That's what I'll do. So if you want to start to communicate at that level where you're really going to reach the senior executives, the other people, you need to go like higher and higher and higher in terms of why, mm. as opposed to the detail. And they'll still want to have the detail. There'll still be a need for the detail, but let's be honest, it's not the most interesting bit. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it is, but mostly it's the why. So what I'm gotcha. trying to do with these opening questions is who are we speaking to That's and good. what do they get out of it brings you up. Yep. I'm not just, delivering the roadmap, like what do they want to hear about? And then you'll get some original thinking in there as opposed to just, here's what I did. For sure. So I'll give you some logistical things. I'll, I'll do one um, thinking through right now. I'm working on 
or we're working on some specific um, items or um, initiatives, I, I'll call them, um, that impact um, targeting, communicate, targeting, having, being smarter and, and uh, targeting communications. Uh, so impact marketing in particular very well in this case um, um, with how we um, target audiences and we're communicating that, c communicating to them. For, you know, for, instead of going broad, um, sometimes we're forced to go broad. How, how might we go a little bit deeper? How might we, um, you know, personalize it to the individual based on what we know about them, um, based on what they told us? Um, versus having to write general marketing communication across. Um, and so <clears throat> working on some things uh, that it help empower them to do that better um, are the things that we're working through. So just, you know, I do say it almost like that, but I, uh, uh, like um, when I prep for the, the items, being able to communicate that to them and how it would impact them. And, and then, you know, there's, multiple people in that room, how it would impact our specifically, maybe the KPIs that they're driving towards that year or the specific initiatives or visions that they're moving forward. That's what my product lane gets to steward quite a bit is empowering internal teams, um, to help them. Um, and so that's kind of the, I would say the focuses and projects that we work on. I love that. What I'd be saying is, okay, I understand what that is. And I'll be going, why are we doing that? Mm. And then if I was presenting that, if I was pitching that, I'd be starting with something along the lines of, imagine if we could deliver, and please excuse me, because my knowledge of the correct language of what you're sending is probably not right. So you can change all the language, but you'll get the good. idea. Yep. Um, imagine if we could deliver the correct, not correct. If, imagine if we could deliver the most powerful sermon, the most powerful message to mm -hmm. someone in need at the moment they need it. Yep. That's what we're trying to do. We want to get the message to the right people at the right time. And if we're mm -hmm. generally marketing to everyone, we're going to hit the miss the mark most of the time. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we can use these details to do that. So if you start right at the top with the why, imagine if we could do this okay even if you had imagine you are a single mom at home struggling you're in a mess and you're just trying to find the strength to help get your kids to school and you got the perfect message that uplifts you and mm. gives you the courage to get going yep that's good but that yeah. that's the why yep that drives the technical detail. And what I'm trying to say to you is let's get you right up at the top with the inspirational gotcha. why that has a real life situation, story, image of someone who needs you. And you actually got the solution that can help put the key message to the right place at the right time. Yep. So okay. Is this kind of making sense? Yeah. So like some of the things I was thinking about was, um, you know, opening up at the beginning with a story that illustrates um, some of the things that we're going to go after. Um, for example, um, let's say, so we, we, it's the Bible app. So I'll just use that in my frame of reference. They, we have plans or devotionals that someone can go through we provide a, a engagement tool when they come and we call it daily refresh that they can see a story, see the verse of the day, uh, have guided prayer. And so um, a story that articulates um, like one day I was feeling down in the morning and just opened up my daily refresh experience and, um, you know, just felt like it was written for me. Um, and that, and that morning that somebody in, marketing communications copywriting wrote that for me in that moment and just really helped me out you know and i'm i need to get better at that messaging if does that make sense but 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 that's the that's the how i how i plan to craft that um and also i get user stories and stuff our our marketing team and stuff does a great job so i can mine for those um but it's the prep for um it's the preparation for that and the practicing of that pre presentation that I feel the most awkward. And does that make sense? So it's the, 
it's the like when I get up there, I get lost in my head and I, I lose my place and those types of things. And, and I can sometimes shoot from the hip, but I kind of want to have a structure and things like that, 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 that I don't go off the rails and stuff like that, if that makes sense. That's where I find myself struggling the most. <clears throat> Definitely. And there's plenty of people out there who say they're better off the cuff shooting from the hip. Yeah. It's never true. Practice. It. There's a famous thing that um, it take. Who is it who said it? Mark Twain said it takes me at least two weeks to write a good impromptu speech. Like yeah. It takes prep. And one of the keys is a refined message is actually far harder to create than a waffling long hour talk. Yeah. So if yep. you want to deliver a really powerful message, it takes crafting and developing. And actually you should be telling it time and time again. And what we get to is the really good leaders. If you feel like you know what they're going to say, because they've said it a hundred times, just mm. in slightly different ways with slightly different stories and they've heard it. So we want to develop that story. Got it. My structure for that is... Ask a question, tell a story, make a point. Got it. That's kind of the entire structure of every presentation I create. So if I was doing the one you've talked about, I'd say, have you ever felt lost in the morning? You know, when you wake up and you think, what am I doing? Where am I going? <laughs> why, why am I doing this? Mm-hmm. And then you kind of pause and you stare at them. Now, the pause is for two reasons. One, they need to associate with your story. And two, it gives you a moment to breathe and center yourself. So it really helps all of us. So you ask the questions, breathe, they think. Then we would tell the story. Imagine one of our Bible app users. You can give him a name. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to come up with an American name now and all that's coming to me is David, Chad. David's a good a American one. name. David, perfect. <laughs> that's my middle name. Um, so David is feeling lost in the morning. He opens up the Bible app and it has content that's created by the marketing team, created by the content team. The marketing team have got him onto the app. We've all worked together to deliver the perfect message to David <laughs> And it's targeted because we know this about David. We know that about David. It's exactly the message he needs to hear at that time. And we can positively impact his life and help him to get through the day happily. The key bit that no one does is after they deliver that last line is the silence and stare. Mm. And I'd like you to do an experiment, and everyone listening to this as well, if you're one of the rebels, I'd like to do an experiment. Next time you watch a presentation, see what the longest pause is that someone has. Generally, presenters are terrible at pausing because they want to fill the silence, they want to keep going, but the pause is where your drama is. And one of the things that I've learned, and this took me a while to learn, is your moments of impact as a speaker aren't when you're speaking. It's when your audience are thinking. Mm. When's the only time your audience are thinking? If I'm not speaking, I guess. Exactly, which is really strange. I remember the first presentation I ever did. I went out there. I was full of passion. I wanted to give as much value as possible. I I spoke all day. I gave everything I had. And I remember at the end, one of the feedback forms said uh, he didn't listen very much. And I remember thinking, what do you mean he didn't listen very much? You've hired me to be a speaker. That is what I am doing. I am speaking. That is my job, to deliver value. What do you mean listen? And it wasn't until I was a lot older I realized, actually, I need to ask a question, pause, they might not answer out loud. They might not interject, but they will think the answer. And the more you get them to think, the more you get them to engage, the more they'll start to be in your story and in what you're doing. So I think that's the delivery bit. That's also normally the most uncomfortable moment for people. It probably is for me. I'm a rambler by nature. So it's true. <laughs> so we need to get you to stop, Nate. We need you to get you to deliver the powerful <laughs> yeah. line and stop 
that's where your moments of power are. And if you watch the really good presenters, the really good speakers, uh, probably the people who do the sermons at the yeah. church, mm-hmm. like the the silence is equally as powerful as the line beforehand. Like they go hand in hand. They're both needed. So what I'm thinking is what we want to do is craft a story that you start to tell people and you've practiced three or four times. You've told your wife, you've told your kids, you've told the cat, <coughs> you've told me. Uh, mm-hmm. Once you've got the delivery down, then you can land it in the next meeting. And that's okay. the part of it. So maybe let's have a go at that story. You've given me the sort of outline. Let's have a go at it now. Let's actually deliver it now. Have a go at delivering it for me. All right. So some of this will come up at the top of my head, but um, just I'll tell you the I'll tell you the prep. Um, so I would probably research a story from our support team, um, from one of our many user stories of how um, the app has impacted them, and so I'd probably use that as an example just for reference. Um, so then I would just lead with that. So imagine if we could, <clears throat> um, sorry, I'm coming up with stuff on the fly here. <laughs> uh, imagine if when you open the app, you had, um, a speaker, uh, in the story that you could connect with. Today, we have stories, uh, one communicator for stories, but what if we could serve up different communicators for stories to different people based on what type of content they connect with, what type of communicators they connect with, what type of um, part of the world they're in, culture, lifestyle. What if we could do that? Imagine the possibilities for people to engage with um, God and have intimacy. So I love that. Mm -hmm. The word imagine is one Mm -hmm. of the most powerful words in presenting because it's a direct command for people to imagine what you're saying. So that's fantastic. The one thing I would say is highlighting the problem before you give the solution Uh uh-huh okay so we kind of went straight into imagine if we could deliver the right message to the right person at the right time which is awesome what's the pain at the start the problem Mm -hmm. and just one little piece on storytelling which i did storytelling there yeah Yeah, you did kind of yeah kind of came halfway (laughs) through if we can reverse and put the pain up front the problem and specifically with storytelling It's about painting an in-the-moment picture. So what I mean by that is it's a very specific moment Mm. that they've just woken up, they're just pouring their coffee, they're doing this. Imagine a scene. You're talking presentation skills on The Rebel Entrepreneur with Alan Donegan, and he's told you to be – he put you on the spot and said, come up with a story now off the top of your head. How would you feel? You'd be nervous, you'd be sweating. But it's that like in the moment exact Mm -hmm. thing. Because quite often people give the like generic overview version without the very specific, this person was here at this point and this is what Mm. they were feeling, why they were feeling, and this is the problem. The more specific you are, the easier it is for people to relate to what you're saying. The more vague you are, like the vagueness of what a KPI is, uh, yep. the vagueness of the roadmap is the specific details. So we want to get you concrete and then link that to the terms that you would normally use. Okay. That's good. I'm nodding my head, everybody. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, that's good. No, I like it. So you mind if I run through it just one more time? Is that no, good? let's do it. Let's do it. <clears throat> so today in the app, when you get to the home screen, when you, when you, eh, I want to start over again. Sorry. 
today when I wake up and I interact with um, the Bible app, I wake up, turn, turn, open the Bible app, read the verse of the day, God's word for me, and see the verse of the day story. That story, that communicator is the same for everybody in the world today. And that's great, except the problem is that communication has to be generalized towards everybody uh, in English, for example, or everybody in Spanish, for example. But what if we could deliver different communicators to different people based on what we know about them, based on their lifestyle, their cultures? Imagine if when I woke up, I felt that that communication was made for me, that that person I could relate to. And because of that relation, I could be driven more into the next steps uh, with intimacy with God. I kind of waffled there at the end, but that's, that's kind of, that's where I'm going. So the mid bit was fantastic. Mm -hmm. You really nailed that because there was a good pause. There was good delivery. Imagine if there was fantastic. So I think I would heighten the start. Got it. So here's can I, I'm going to play with you and just give you my version and you can then take it and have another go. See how Sweet. you develop stories. Okay. My version would be this morning I rolled and I'm making this up because it wasn't the first thing I did. But, you know, <laughs> this morning I rolled over in bed. I picked up my phone. The first thing I did was read the daily message on the Bible app. I read the verse and I got the same verse is everyone in the world. So it didn't matter if it was Alan in Poland or Nate in Oklahoma or David in the UK, we all got the same verse. But would God actually be delivering the same message to every one of us or would he be speaking directly to us? what we really, and then you've got your middle bit, but mm -hmm. can you see how I kind of like just enhance yep. the, yep. Yep. everyone gets That's the good. same message and then yep. you hit them with your strength of the message in the middle. Then we need the close and the close then goes into, here's what we're doing. Here's how we're doing it. And here's how it ties into everything you're doing. Then you've set up a huge why yep. uh, that ties it in. I'm feeling excited about this. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, yes. I'm going to have to listen to this episode over and over again to process that more. But yes, I, I'm there. So the, the tie-in for everyone listening to this, absolutely everyone, the more specific you can show the problem, and the problem is everyone gets the same message. It's not personalized. We're not really helping everyone at the same level that we should be. Maybe we're failing some of the people. That's the problem. The more specific you make the problem, the more people will understand it and the more they'll want the solution. And that is the key pretty much to all sales. And I don't care what you're talking about. Presenting is selling. You're selling an idea. You're selling what you're doing. You're selling your vision. You're selling your roadmap. You're selling where you're going. You're selling your product. That's what we're doing. So we need that really strong why that tells people what we're doing. And every presentation I've ever written, my most successful ones have a really strong why and a strong problem. So the one I became famous for for a long way, while was five ways to build a business with no debt. And it starts with, I was told to create a business the traditional way, write a business plan, get a loan, go into debt, <laughs> Spent, and you can almost feel the energy drive out mm -hmm. of your body as you talk about the problem. Then it went on to the solution. You don't have to go into debt. There is a way to do it. Here's the solution. Everyone gets excited. But I have to amp up the pain of the problem to get them excited about the solution. So the more specific you can make the pain that you're fixing, the more specific, the more visceral, the more feeling you can get behind letting people down, it not quite working, the problem, the pain. And I don't care what it is, what, what it is, whether you're selling art, photography, the 
to get people to invest into the Bible app so it delivers properly what we actually want to deliver to people. It doesn't matter. That's the key. So get them to feel the pain, Nate. All right. I will. (laughs) All right. Next question for presenting. And this is more... Uh, this is more along the lines of when I'm in the moment and when I'm presenting, and maybe this is part of practice too, but the, um, what I want to say, body language, that one, uh, things that I know I've gotten feedback on because I ask feedback quite a bit when I present and stuff is like, like even right now, and partly preparation would help with this is, uh, when I'm talking, I don't like to look at people in the face or the eyes because they just, their faces distract me. I'm just being honest. And so I'm trying to work on eye contact, but it is, that is the most uncomfortable thing for me. And so do you have like any tips or tricks? Um, it's true. It's just, it's just weird. No, I love it. I love the honesty. Their <laughs> so, faces are distracting. Is my face distracting, Nate? <laughs> uh, you want to be truthful? Yeah. Everybody's face is distracting. Um, and it's even in normal conversation. I find I always will look somebody in the eye while they're talking to me. But when I start talking to them, I'll look off because I'm thinking mm-hmm. and, I, and their expressions. I'm, I think it's because I'm trying to read their body language and that distra- it distracts me from what I'm trying to say. And so just getting better at that body language as part of my presentation is something that I just struggle with. So I didn't know if there's tips and tricks. How do you do that? I know obviously practice, but like intentional practice, I guess, what intentional practice things would you recommend in that arena? Okay. So let's start with the why Mm -hmm. and then the eye contact averages and then go on to the specific tricks and tips. Gotcha. The general why is in Western culture, we see it as a sign of charisma, truth, and contact. Mm -hmm. And there's this story that we tell each other. When a kid's lying, where do they look? Oh, like down yeah. and at the ground. They're making up a story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. making up a story. They're not looking at you. They're kind yeah. of like, oh, sorry. They just kind of make it all up. They will never look you in the eyes. And it was completely not true because psychopaths have learned to look you straight in the eye whilst they're lying. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> that's the story we have in Western culture is if you're looking me in the eye, you are truthful, honest, and I believe you. Mm-hmm. Now, that's the why it's incredibly important. The averages, let's just take one-to-one to to start with. There's the person speaking and there's the person listening, and you rightly differentiated between the two. For the person speaking, on average, for Western culture, what percentage of the time do you think they maintain eye contact with the person they're talking to? I have no idea, but I'm going to say 20%. Yeah, it's about 30 on average. Okay. All right. So, you know, about a third of the time, 30% ish, they're maintaining eye contact. How about the person listening? They probably, it's probably higher, probably 70, 80%. Yeah, it's about 70% because eye contact is a sign of listening. Mm-hmm. Like I'm looking at you, I'm listening to your words. So that's the average. If you want to have more charisma, more impact, more connection, you need to be slightly higher than the average. Now, never go to 100% because that will creep people out. Okay. Okay. That's good. (laughs) But if you're talking like when you're speaking one-to-one, you want to be at 40 or 50, Mm -hmm. more eye contact is better. Now, if we take this from one-to-one to... A small group, let's say your leadership peer team is 10 people. What's the maximum amount of eye contact you can get with each person? Yeah, whatever the amount of time is divided by the number of people, I guess, is the percentage, essentially. Yeah, so if there's 10 people, like if you had 100% eye contact, you could get 10% for each person. Yeah. So you're already way below what it would be in a one-to-one conversation. So you have to work 10 times as hard if it's a group of people. Mm -hmm. If there's three people in there, you almost want to be at 100% eye contact split between the three just to hit the average. Okay. 
Makes so sense. the eye contact becomes more and more critical the higher the number of people. Okay. Now, how do you do it? How do you get past the feeling of discomfort? It's going to be practice, and it's going to practice delivering the line, stopping, and then staring them in the eye. Because that sounds- that's your moment of impact. <laughs> That sounds intense. You're going to have to send me a message. How many have you stared <laughs> lovingly at somebody in their eyes or something? Man, it just well, makes me, st- that's like of, of all the things that make me like the, a lot of things don't make me nervous. That makes me nervous, oddly enough. So, well, that's interesting. So I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, how does it make you nervous? What do you imagine? Or well, let's phrase that in a different way. Like imagine I was going to take over from you feeling mm-hmm. nervous, staring someone in an eye. Yep. Uh, when I think about gaining eye contact with them, what do I have to say to myself? What do I have to picture to feel nervous? <sighs> mm, I don't know. It's like, it's like when I ramble, I'm like trying to fill the void. Like I'm nervous about the void. And I think staring somebody in the eyes is active, meaning... I'm not usually talking while I'm doing that. Maybe sometimes I am, but um, I don't know. It's so really hard for me happen? to pinpoint. What might happen? Like if it goes wrong, what's going to happen? Oh, like that. If I logically think about it, Alan, well, nothing's going to happen bad. No, illogically. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely but not either. talking to the rational part of you right now. <laughs> but the irrational part of me is like, maybe they'll think I'm creepy. Maybe I'm you know, maybe I'll scare them because, you know, I can be intense, you know, that's the type of, um, I'm a little demonstrative in my, um, body language. And so staring people in the eye, uh, while I'm talking, I I might feel a little overbearing. So that's, I think what is going through my head. Okay. Sure. Subconsciously mostly, but yeah. It normally is like, it's never, conscious it's just like oh i don't want to do that it's just you're not there going oh i might scare them i might creep them out quick look away uh, that doesn't normally happen your brain works so fast <laughs> you just do it so that makes complete sense like if you've got a history where someone who said to you like you're pretty intense nate and you can be you have a very direct nature and i love it i appreciate it massively um, but if that's the case, then you go, well, I don't want to scare people off, so I won't gain the eye contact and I'm a bit worried about it. Um, that makes complete sense to me. What I would say is, how important is it for you to get your message across and stick? It's extremely important. That's why I'm practicing it now, because um, I've seen the fruits of when my message doesn't stick. Does that make sense? So Mm -hmm. what I've seen is, especially when I'm communicating to a wider audience, one-on-one, I do really well. I I, I do fair, I guess I should say. Um, But uh, when it's to a wider audience, people leave and I feel if I'm not succinct, I'm not connecting people, I'm not making them feel a certain way about it, they leave with different interpretations of what I said is what I've, what I've learned, this, which is what I'm trying to clean up. Like how can, part of that's the rambling, part of that's going off script and not being prepared. And so I'm saying things and sometimes the words don't match the intent, if that makes sense. And so um, just trying to make sure that my intent is communicated and as clear um, and a, I say mutual understanding way as possible. Um, and the reason why I'm good one-on-one is because I did, uh, I was a Navy recruiter for three years and so they taught me professional selling skills. And so, um, I learned really well how to connect with somebody one-on-one, but to an audience, the practice I've had is just trial by fire. And so, um, just learning how to, you know, go to a wider, a somewhat wider audience, not like a packed house, uh, you know, sermon wise, but like, uh, uh, just, you know, team, you know, 10 to 20 folks max, you know, sometimes less. And, um, people leave with different interpretations. So I find myself having a ton of one-on-one meetings afterwards, clearing up the mess <laughs> that maybe I have created, uh, with my lack of presentation skills. So that's what I'm trying to clean up. If that makes okay. sense. Okay. So here's your challenge. Uh, 
the idea I want to give you is of the foundational phrase. Okay. So when you're delivering your next presentation, I want you to have three points. Okay. Each point will have a foundational phrase. Gotcha. And that's a little saying, half a sentence, a few words that sums up your whole point in one go. And to give you an example, it's an old example, but I think it's a good one. When Steve Jobs launched the MacBook Air, okay. he stood there and went, ladies and gentlemen, the world's thinnest laptop. Then he talked for ages <laughs> and then said again, the world's thinnest laptop. That's the foundational phrase. I got you. And then everyone living there goes, I just saw the world's thinnest laptop. It mm. was so cool. It was this, it was that. They've got all the other stuff. That's fine. But the foundational phrase hit everyone in the face and they knew exactly what it is. So you need you. a foundational phrase. And then for each one of those three points, we'll ask a question, tell a story, make the point. And the making the point has the foundational phrase. And then at the end, you kind of repeat your three foundational phrases. That's your takeaways. And humans in the verbal communication need to have it repeated several times for us mm -hmm. to go, oh, that's important. He said it twice. That's good. She said it twice or three times, or four times. If it's a book, we read it once and we highlight the bits we think are important because we can mm -hmm. just go back and read it again. But in verbal communication, you can't. You have to hear it repeated. So what I would do, if we were doing this, like the actual story we started with a minute ago, I'd be going, what's the foundational phrase for that story? That's Is good. it the right message at the right time? Is it a personalized message to each reader? Is it like there's some kind of like four word saying that yep. sums it up that you need to repeat every meeting <laughs> for the next year until they go, okay, I've got it, Nate. This is what you're doing. This is the one thing that we're focused on. But it's that foundational phrase that everyone understands. Yep. I think the sum it up, it would be because the audience is um, people that would be utilizing these because I wouldn't be the one actually um, writing the stuff or presenting the stuff for in most cases, some, some cases maybe. But the foundational phrase would be how could we be smarter at communicating with our users? Um, that's, that's it. How do we target? You know, for them, that would be what they would feel because they know our mission, our vision, our values already. So they know, hey, that, and then I could, I could use maybe a, so that phrase, so that we could X, Y, Z, you know, we could target somebody in Nigeria um, that has a low bandwidth phone or somebody that's in, um, you know, Southeast Asia, you know, those types of things. Um, that's kind of how, yeah, I need to think about it more. I'm brainstorming now, but yeah, yeah. I, I, so the foundational I think, phrase might yeah. be delivering personalized messages. Yep. Or whatever it is. It needs to be mm. three or four words Got that it. you say, imagine if we could deliver personalized messages. And I want you to actually use your hand to underline it. it as you say it. Okay. So this is one of the things. It's called spatial anchoring or highlighting. Like You know, like you would highlight on a page. You put it in yellow. Yep. You can literally draw under the words in front of someone and mm -hmm. they'll go, oh, he's highlighting it for me. I should pay attention. We I got gotcha. you. Deliver a personalized message. Okay. And then you go back to the normal hand gestures and body language, but you're underlining the key phrase and then you say it at the end. And then you say the three things my team are focused on are delivering a personalized message. Mm. Number two, number three, and that's the end. That's it. But you need to highlight that. And I think that will solve that problem of what specifically was Nate's message within this. It will cause them to go, okay, there's three very clear elements and I can repeat that back. And even if they don't remember all of the detail of the roadmap and all of the detail of what you've said, they'll be able to get the three key points, which will get most of what you said back to them. That's good. Yep. Foundational phrase, 
ask a question, something tell else, a story, something, tell make a story, a <laughs> make a point. Um, awesome. Yep. That's cool. very helpful. So like, just to summarize what we've been through today, the three questions I ask before I write the talk are, who's my audience? What do they get out of it? And then the kind of question I think you know is, which is what do you want them to think, feel, or do differently afterwards? So what's the action they're going to take? What are they going to think afterwards? So I I do those three. That gives me a guide to what I'm going to present. Then I go, okay, based on those three questions, what's my three key messages? And I would come up with the three foundational phrases to start with, because those are my hooks That's what I can build the whole talk of. And when I'm delivering it, for me, if I'm delivering a talk, I would have a piece of paper Mm -hmm. with very large writing of one, two, and three. Okay. And I just have it in front of me so that if I ever get lost, I breathe, I look Mm -hmm. down, and I go, which of my three points are am I on? Okay, I'll pick up there. And I'll keep going. And that's enough of a note so that you know where you are. Okay. And the key is no one ever knows exactly what you're going to say next. So as long as you say something, you're fine. But it just needs to be within that track. And if you can train yourself to if you ever feel like you're rambling, stop. Breathe. Look down at the sheet of paper work out which one you're on, and then go back to the point. Okay. If you can do that, you will end the rambling because you'll always be, okay, I'm on point one. I've started to ramble. Let me deliver the foundational phrase, and then I'll move on to two. Okay. And then you start to talk about two. You ask a question. You tell a story. You make the point. Then you go, okay, I think I'm rambling. (laughs) Let me deliver the foundational phrase. Pause. Stare at them. Uh, and I'm going to practice staring them in the eyes. What if we could deliver personalized digital messages at the right time? That's good. Huge pause, stare, and that's you're going to get used to it. And you've told me that your message is more important than your discomfort. Mm-hmm. So if you really want these messages to land, stare them in the eyes. Yep. If you truly care about your message, which I get the feeling you care about your message more than discomfort. Yes, I do. I feel like you're testing me right now, Alan. (laughs) By staring me in the eyes. I love you, Nate. Um, (laughs) So you got the three foundational phrases. Then I expand from the three foundational phrases to like, what's the question I'm going to open with? And For me, if I know what the question is, that's enough to get me started and into the flow. And I know roughly what the story is and what the point is. So I always have a question I open for every presentation I've ever done. So I do um, the five ways to start a business with no money starts with, what do you think stops people from starting a business? That's my opening question. And everyone's thinking about what stops people. That's the problem. The presentations, I always used to start with, have you ever sat through, seen, or watched a boring presentation? And everyone nods because they have. And I've gotten them thinking about the pain and the problem I'm then going to solve. So I know exactly what the opening question is, which mm-hmm. is that's the like hardest bit. And then I feel comfortable because I know what I'm going to say. I say it, I deliver it, I look at them, and then I'm flowing. So foundational phrase, the question, the story, and the point. And if you've got that, the slides, then you might have a bit of backup data, but you don't even really need that many slides unless you, like, within one of them, you want to go, okay, here's where we are on a roadmap, and you highlight mm-hmm. it. But you don't need as many slides with as much detail. And one of the reasons that people sometimes leave going, I'm not entirely sure what the message was, is because people pack too much information into their presentations so the key yep. messages don't stand out. Mm-hmm. So I think less is more, just those three points. And then the summary, you really want to hit them hard and stare at them. 
just deliver the three three foundational phrases, your closing message, and then just stop. It's good. That would be how I would do it. How do you feel about that, Nate? How are you feeling? Are you okay? I feel good. I will have to re-listen to this to get the highlights and stuff um, and take some notes and then re-listen to it again. But I feel really good. This is really good practical tips for me. And I'm just going to have to get good at eye contact. Uh, and I'm just going to, yeah, I'm going to listen to it and get better at uh, presenting and practicing. And then maybe we'll meet again and see see how far I've come or what else I, I need to work on. I would love that. Yeah, I'd love to hear an update. There's so many more like advanced strategies, tips, ideas, ways to hone presentations. I feel like this is a great start that's going to get you on track. You're going to practice and then you're going to come back with a whole bunch of different questions, which I love. Awesome. Excellent. Nate, you are a legend. Thank you so much for coming on the show. A final closing message from me, and then I have a big offer for you. So the final closing message is presenting is something that people just don't enjoy. They don't like it. They get scared. They get nervous. They feel uncomfortable. They feel like they're forcing their message on people. There are all sorts of weirdnesses that go on. But the thing I've learned is that the more you can enjoy presenting, the more your audience will enjoy listening to you. So if we can find a way for you to enjoy talking to people, enjoy sharing your message, impacting, communicating, helping people with what you're saying, they will start to enjoy listening to you. So find a way, start asking the question, how can I enjoy presenting? How can I learn to love communicating? Start asking the question, finding your answers and communicating your message. Because if you can learn to enjoy presenting, your audience will more likely enjoy listening to you. So that's the closing message. And now I have a big offer for you. As some of you probably know, my wife and I are off to a big event called Date with Destiny with Tony Robbins. And it's happening in Dallas, uh, not Date with Destiny, Unleash the Power Within. And it's happening in Dallas, in Texas, at the beginning of November, November the 9th to the 12th. Katie and I are going, our friend Finn is joining us, and Stephen, one of our regular listeners, is coming as well. And I think there might be a few other people. So we're really looking forward to it. And Tony Robbins has very kindly given us a extra ticket, which I'm very excited about and I want to give to you. So we have a spare ticket, which has a value of like $1,000 that you could have to come to Unleash the Power Within in Dallas, in Texas with Katie and I. You'd have to get yourself there. We're not paying for your accommodation or your transport, but we have a free ticket for you. So if you would like to come to Unleash the Power Within with Katie and I, maybe look it up online, watch the trailer of Unleash the Power Within from Tony Robbins. Uh, it's an event. This is our fourth time of going. It is quite the self-development event. It's like a four-day giant event with huge energy, lots of music. And I'd rather tell you exactly what it's going to be like. It's going to be loud, intense, and fun. And on the end of day one, you end up walking on fire. It is quite the event, quite transformational. Um, if that sounds like something you would be interested in coming to, we have a spare ticket. What you need to do is send me a email. My email is alan at therebelschool.com. Send me an email. Tell me why you would like to come. Do that. I will reply and then I'll pick someone who sent a message to me and they will get a free ticket to the event worth $1,000. Uh, and it's like an incredible opportunity. So thank you to Holly from Tony Robbins for organizing that for us and giving us that ticket that we can just pass on and give away. I love that. So it would be incredible to meet you there. 
let me know if you'd like to come with us. And thank you for listening to the podcast and being one of the rebels alongside us. I wish you all of the success in the future. Thank you so much for tuning in. Stay rebellious, have fun presenting, and I will see you soon.